Hello and welcome. In this presentation, I'll be talking about statistical process control. We'll look at uh, what exactly statistical process control is and what are some key elements in constructing a statistical process control. Now, statistical process control, or SPC in short, is an application of statistical techniques uh, to determine whether the process is delivering products as per the customer specification. In other words, are we creating products or services that can satisfy the customer? And the reason why we need some kind of a control process uh, uh, or control system for the processes is because there are always variations in the output that processes generate. And these are because of several sources of variations. It could be because a machine might have uh, certain things that might have changed between times and hence the outputs are coming out differently. You might have labor with different skill levels that could have generated different kinds of outputs. But as an organization, it's important that all the outputs that are being created are within certain limits uh, so that we can satisfy what the customer has specified to the company. Now, if you think about the types of performance measures that organizations look into or consider, you can categorize them broadly into two types. One are the variables, the ones that you can measure. If they have quantitative numbers that you can capture. And then you have attributes. These are the ones which you really cannot measure, but you can count them. So a variable would be an example as a diameter of a screw. So you have a specific diameter that the customer wants, and that's something which you can continuously measure within your outputs and ensure that the outputs are in line with what the customer wants. Attributes, on the other hand, would be an example. The example could be something like a tear in a fabric, which a textile company uses to make, uh, let's say, t-shirts. So uh, one could examine the number of times you have these tears in a certain fabric that they're using to make their final outputs. And that would be a different kind of a performance measure which some companies would be relying on. And there are control mechanisms that we can use for either of these scenarios. Um, we, we need to have some mechanism through which we collect data and utilize that data to understand if our processes are in control. Now, one option would be to do a complete inspection of every single thing that we make and try to see if everything is in control or not. And the other approach, and this obviously is expensive, uh, time consuming, and therefore the alternative approach would be to take a sample from the output and, and this random sample that you've collected, which you've decided of a certain size, uh, can be collected multiple times over uh, several successive samples. We can determine whether uh, the processes are in control or not. And then if they are not in control, what kind of changes need to be made to the processes so that they can be brought back to control. Now, getting back to statistical process control, uh, if we were to think of a distribution of all the outputs that are being generated. So the green distribution that we see here, the screen distribution is essentially the distribution of all outputs that are coming out of a certain process, a certain machine or some service process, everything that is being generated from that, you can consider that to be your green uh, curve that you see here. And since this is very difficult to collect all data that we are generating in a process, we decide to use a certain sample, which is a smaller set from that entire output. That would be this blue line that you see here, and that is a sample distribution. What you really want is a random sample, and this random sample should be a good representation of your uh, actual process performance, which is the green uh, process distribution curve that you see here. So the average, the mean of the two should be identical in some way, close enough. Uh, more, in most cases, what you'll find is that they will be as close as possible. That's the objective that organization should have when they choose a certain sample as a representative sample for the entire process. And so that's, uh, that's what we have here as 25 for some process here. So assuming that this is a delivery process, and assuming that 25 minutes is the delivery time that uh, the process is expected to have or 
something which you think uh, the overall process is supposed to have and then out of the entire number of deliveries that this organization might have made over the course of one year suppose you take a sample of certain number of deliveries that sample which is the blue curve should also have an average of about 25 minutes that's the idea here now sample mean uh, is nothing but sum of all the outputs that you see, all the observations, divided by the total number of observations. So, you know, so that just like in the previous graph, the 25-minute average is essentially taking all observations that you had in the sample and then dividing by total number of sample points that you had uh, numbers for. So that's a simple uh, mean which we need to have when we are constructing a statistical process control. The other thing which uh, we will many times account for is the variability, which can be captured either as a range, which is nothing but taking the largest number in the sample and the smallest number. So if we are collecting information about delivery times, then what was the longest it took to deliver and what was the shortest it took to deliver, just the difference of the two will be the range. A more sophisticated version of variability would be to consider a standard deviation which essentially is the square root of the variance of distribution. And there's a formula that you have here. And this formula uh, essentially takes the number or any delivery that you have made in that example of delivery times. And that um, is subtracted from the uh, mean of all the deliveries that you made. And then this formula is incorporated so that you can get what the uh, variance will be. And when you take the square root of that, the sigma, is basically the standard deviation of that process. So this is also useful uh, in statistical process control and we will again look at uh, these kinds of usage for both mean and standard deviation or mean and range to make the process in control. Now when we are trying to bring a process in control we have to be we have to be aware of this fact that the reason why something is not in control could be either due to some random variations, some unidentified random variations, which are unavoidable. Actually, that is part of the process which will exist irrespective of whatever you do. And these are random variations that always exist in nature. So these are called common causes. And we cannot do too much about anything about common causes, actually. What we're really after are these assignable causes. And these are the ones which are causes for which factors can be identified and eliminated. So we actually can determine whether it is because of certain machine that is why we have processes that are out of control or is it because of lack of training, some cause that we can uh, attribute to this kinds of, this kinds of uh, out of control situations. Uh, and this is the assignable cause situation which we are trying to find using statistical process control. Now within statistical process control, the way we understand if a process is in control or not is by using what we call control charts. Now control charts are essentially time order diagrams uh, where we, we try to plot all the outputs that are coming from a process. And there are two limits within that control chart. One is the upper control limit and the other is the lower control limit. So essentially every output that is coming out of a process should be between these two limits. If they go outside these limits, then we know that there is some assignable cost potentially that needs to be identified and eliminated uh, to make this process uh, better or bring that in control. The way we use uh, control charts is that first we take a random sample from the process and then in that sample we calculate the mere performance measure. This could be either a variable, which means you can quantify and measure it, or it could be an attribute where you will be counting them uh, in terms of how many times you were successful or not successful, or how many times there was some defect or not. Now, if a statistic falls outside the control limit, lower and upper control limit, or even if it is inside the control limit, but it exhibits some unusual behavior, we'll see what this means then we will look for some assignable cause. What, what is the reason why we are observing these kinds of situations? Then we eliminate that cause, especially if it degrades the performance. So 
we have to make sure that we don't have any cause which results in outcomes that are not satisfactory for the customer. But if sometimes the cause is actually helping our process to be better, it will also show up in the control chart as something which is abnormal. But in this case, it's actually improving performance. So what we have to do in this case is to incorporate that cause as part of the system. So we want that to be the normal way of doing things so that every time we can actually generate that output, uh, which is better quality than otherwise. Yeah, and then reconstruct the control chart after any changes have been made to the process and then keep collecting data again to ensure that all this is uh, in control. And then we repeat this procedure periodically to ensure uh, our system is in control over time. So this is an example of a control chart we see here. We have an upper control limit, we have a lower control limit, and there's this nominal value, which is sort of the average value that we're expecting to come out of the process. Now we collect samples. So the first sample we see um, that value, the dot that you see here, is inside the upper and lower control limit. So it's within the range that we have set for ourselves as part of this process. Then we collect the second sample. The second sample also we see that this particular output that we had is also within the upper and lower control limit. No need to con be concerned at this point in time. Um, third one, when we observe that data, we observe that this one actually has gone outside the control limit. So this is clearly an assignable cause is potentially bringing this particular output outside the lower control limit. So we are lower in terms of our numbers below the control limit that we had established here. So for this one, we have to identify what is that assignable cause which could have resulted in this third sample coming out of, out, outside the control limit. Now, when we think about control charts, uh, we also have to be aware that uh, it's a time-oriented um, chart where we are looking at it over time across multiple samples. So for example, we could see these outputs, something like what we see in this figure where all the samples that we are, collect we are collecting data from, they all fall within the upper control limit and lower control limit. And they are varying across that nominal value uh, on both sides. So some of the numbers are above these, the nominal value and some of them are below the nominal value. So essentially it's showing that it's nicely distributed around that nominal value, hence uh, it's a normal system. There's no action that is needed in this case. We could have a situation like this where everything is still inside the upper and lower control limits, but we notice that there is a systematic pattern in terms of where these numbers are going. They're all going in one direction. They are moved away from the nominal line that we see in the middle, and they are diverted towards the lower control limit. This would be an example of a situation where we know there is something going on, some run which is taking these outputs towards a certain control limit, and we need to take action as in why this could be happening here. We could also have a situation where once again, everything seems to be inside the control limit, but the change that we see here is way more than the kinds of changes that we were observing earlier. And so this big change from a low value to that high value here is also a cause for concern. We have to monitor the situation as in why this might be happening. We still have them spread across the two sides of the nominal values. So at least that part is great that we, we have some of them above the nominal value, some of them below the nominal value. Even this move that we see, this sudden move is also moving it around that nominal value. But still the fact that it has such a big jump makes us believe that we need to monitor the system, the process to see if uh, there is something uh, which could be assignable for this change. And then finally, we could have a situation where clearly one of the output could be outside the control limit. And in this case also, we have to take action as in why this must have exceeded the control limit, has come out of the control limit that we have set for the, for the organization. Now, when we take action, we have to be aware of the types of error that we could commit while taking these actions. One is a type one error, the other one is type two error. 
Now type one error are the errors that occurs when an employee is going to conclude that the process is actually out of control just by looking at the sample results that uh, some of them have fallen outside the control limit. But in reality, actually, this was happening just because of pure randomness. So there is, a, there is an incorrect conclusion that the process is out of control when it was actually in control. That would be an example of type one type of error. Type two errors are the ones when uh, an employee concludes that the process is in control uh, and only randomness is present in that particular process, but in reality, the process is out of control. So we are incorrectly concluding that everything is in control but, uh, and only randomness exists. But in reality, there are some assignable causes that are causing the system or the process to, uh, to behave in a certain way. So these two errors we try to eliminate while we are making decisions as managers. Now within control charts, variable control charts are the ones which account for anything that can be measured. And attributable or attribute control charts are the ones that we can uh, use when we have uh, performance measures that can be counted but cannot be measured. So in variable control charts, we have R charts. These are the ones that measure the variability of the process. And X bar charts are the ones that measure uh, whether the process is generating everything on average within that target value that we have set up for the for the uh, process. The attribute control chart, on the other hand, if we take the P chart, it measures the proportion of defective services or products that are generated by the process. Uh, in other words, if we have several outputs, what is the percentage of times that we see defective outputs coming out of a system will be P chart. And the C chart is the one which captures whether there are more than one defects that are present in a service or product when we get those outputs from a process. Are we getting more than one defect per product or per service generated? And so these are the types of control charts which organizations use depending on the type of performance measure they have, the type of outputs they have. So overall in this uh, presentation, we understand uh, how uh, quality management uh, tools work, what exactly statistical process control is, uh, what are the kinds of uh, control charts we develop, the control limits and how to interpret the control limits when uh, something is outside the range or something has a certain pattern that we observe. Thank you.